I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you you call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glory you say You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glory you say I was an orphan, but you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, so excited to welcome you to worship this morning, whether you are joining online or in the sanctuary or the loft worshiping with us today. Uh, my name is Sutton Smith, and I just wrapped up the summer with First Church uh, serving as a pastoral intern. Um, I'm in the car now getting ready to head to Connecticut back to school, but I just wanted to say thank you for having me this summer. Thanks to all of you for your hospitality. Um, it was a great summer, and I look forward to keeping up with what you all are doing. I'd love to invite you to scan the QR code that you see on the screen or in your bulletin to check in and let us know that you're in worship today. Welcome indeed to virtual worship at First Church. My name is Katie Gilbert and I serve as our executive pastor and use she, her pronouns. I wanna take just a minute to draw your attention to a couple of announcements about things happening here at First Church. The first is we hope that you received our notification and have noticed it in our comments, but today is the last Sunday that our live stream 
will be featured on the Facebook Live platform. The Facebook features are changing and we will no longer be able to push out our uh, virtual worship like we have been. So we invite you next week and in the weeks following to join us on our YouTube channel. You can find the link to our YouTube channel. Someone will drop it in our comments this morning, but you can always find it by going to our First Church website, www.firstchurchbhm.com, scrolling all the way to the bottom, and you'll see the icons for several of our social media platforms. The little uh, play button is that YouTube link to our channel. We invite you to subscribe and plan to join us there weekly. Please know that you can comment and interact just like you have been on Facebook, but through the YouTube platform. That will continue at 9 a.m. every week, just like we have been. Our second announcement is to make sure you have made note of our Labor Day plans. For in-person worship on Labor Day Sunday, which uh, is September 4th, we will have one worship service at 11 a.m. here in the sanctuary at First Church. So if you're planning to come in person, please make note. Of course, we will still offer our live stream on YouTube at 9 a.m. Last but not least, on Sunday, September 11th, we will have our big fall stewardship kickoff with a luncheon. We want you to come and join us as together we feast and celebrate 150 years, but also move into the stewardship season together. Now, please know that this lunch is at no cost to you. However, we do need a reservation so that we can make sure to have enough food and um, goodies for everyone. So please take just a moment, visit our coming up tab, click on that stewardship kickoff luncheon slide and go in to our form and sign up to let us know uh, how many of you all will be joining us. There's a place to let us know how many adults and kid meals and all that good stuff. We sure hope that you will join us because we are continuing to celebrate our 150 years together in this calendar year, but also really looking forward to exploring the ways that this church was open then, is open now, and will be open always. So come and join us. Friends, with these announcements shared, I invite you to hear our call to worship this morning. God is calling us out of the places we hide, out of insecurity, out of shame, out from under that which silences love and justice. Come out, people of God. Though we may be afraid, though we will be at risk, though the cross stands as a threat, God calls us to courage. Our God is a God of resurrection, of new life after devastation, of hope in the grip of evil, and so we dare to proclaim with pride and faith our truths. We believe in the power of love. We believe in solidarity with the suffering. We believe we are each valuable. We believe that our togetherness is transformative. The world is longing for holy truths that reveal voices that speak real words of hope. Come out, people of God.
I invite you to join me this morning in our prayer of confession and hear the words of forgiveness. Divine love, forgive us when we hurt ourselves, others, and creation. Forgive our labeling of one another when we call our siblings good or bad, right or wrong, us or them. Forgive our internal labeling when we berate ourselves with shoulds and not enoughs, or when we esteem ourselves as more special than others. Forgive our greed and negligence when we prioritize our needs now over care for creation and others for years to come. We turn to you, remembering you are filled with compassionate grace. Friends, the divine does not see in categories the way our minds often do. Instead, our creator sees who we fully are and all we are capable of and welcomes us home with love. Not only are you forgiven, but you are called to follow this example of forgiveness in your life with others. May we accept this grace and share it with others. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. This time I'd like to invite you to hear our first scripture reading found from Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless, void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. At this time, I invite you all into a time of prayer. Let us pray. Creator God, we, we breathe deep and we give thanks for life, life that is a gift. And God, we give thanks for both light and darkness, God. For we know and believe that life God, life is created in darkness. Life is created in the absence of life, where there's nurturing, where there is a glimpse of hope and new beginnings. And God, we enter the world where it's filled with goodness and light. And so God, help us to understand nuance and understanding that we need both light and darkness, God. God, we continue to pray for places in our world where there is unrest and war, God. We as Westerners, as Americans, we forget. But God, you never forget. You never leave the sides of those that need you. And so, God, now we lift up, we continue to pray for those in the Ukraine and anywhere else in the world where we are even unaware that war is waging. God, we, we ask for forgiveness for being ignorant, for not caring enough. God, we pray for our country and its leaders, world leaders. We pray for our state and its leaders in our city, and its leaders, God. God, we pray for our church and who you're calling us to be, that we will follow Jesus, that we will love you with everything we have, and we will love neighbor as self, and we will care for creation. And so God, we just ask that you be ever present in our lives, whether we are in our homes this morning, in person on campus or out on vacation, God, we just pray that you be with us. God, be with us and remind us that you are ever present. And now we join our voices together and pray the prayer that Jesus told the disciples to pray. Our Father, Mother who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second scripture reading today comes from the book of Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 through 21. Hear these words. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. 
For God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. Then the people stood at a distance while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Friends, as we move into a time of offering, you are invited to give generously, and you can do so at the on our website or by mailing in a check. But may we respond with our worship, with giving in our church. I'm Stephanie York Arnold. I'm the senior pastor here at First Church, and my pronouns are she and her. So today, I want us to dive deeper into our understanding of non-dualistic thinking, life beyond the binary, or either-or thinking that we often tend to do. Richard Rohr happens to be one of today's greatest teachers on the contemplative mind and the growth process out of dualistic thinking. He writes, Dualistic thinking is operative almost all the time. It's when we choose one side or temporarily prefer one side and then call the other side of an equation false, wrong, heresy, or untrue. It's often something to which we have not yet been exposed or it threatens you or your ego in a way or is beyond your education. The dualistic mind splits the moment and forbids the dark side, the mystery, the paradoxical. This is the common level of conversation that we have in our world. Basically, it lacks humility and patience, and it's the complete opposite of contemplation. He continues, in my book, The Naked Now, I called non-silence dualistic thinking, where everything is separated into opposites like life and death. The dualistic mind is almost the only mind left in the West. We even think it, that it means to be educated, 
to be very good at dualistic thinking, but it is what Jesus and Buddha would call judgmental thinking in Matthew 7, 1 through 5, and why they both strongly warn against it. You see, our brain's desire to separate everything into opposite. It seems to make things easier for us to sort, or at least we think so. Matter of fact, our Genesis creation story has our creator doing this very thing, separating things into opposites. Or at least that's the language that we find in our Bible. It says, light was separated from dark, and day was separated from night. But the truth is, we have language that is much richer and less binary today that helps us describe light and dark, day and night. We know we don't just have what the world looks like at high noon or at midnight. We have sunrises and sunsets, dusks and dawn, eclipses of the sun and the moon. These are periods of time when light and dark are not easily separated into opposite categories. I guess these moments must rest on the conjunctions and the participles of our texts, and and from. And I believe they serve an important point. Looking at less binary ways of seeing light and dark may prove to be a formative experience for us that may allow us then to be less binary about more difficult concepts in our lives. So let me ask, can we always separate light from dark? Or can we always sort things into day or night categories? Look at some of these photos with me and see if you can tell which is which. Is it a sunrise or a sunset? Look at this one. Now, how about this one? And finally, this one. It's hard, isn't it? We see both the light and the dark and all the colors that they can mix together. Honestly, we can't tell with confidence if it's the beginning or the end of the day. The dangerous thing about opposing language like light and dark is also that we often assign value and worth to it. In our society, we have assigned light the color for the good guys most often and dark the color for the bad. Think back to black and white westerns. The Lone Ranger didn't ride a black horse with a black hat. He rode Hio Silver, who was a Palomino, and he wore white Stetson. Most movies and stories followed this script. Light colors equaled good, dark colors equal bad. Now, to be fair, thankfully, we had Zorro, who rode a black horse and dressed in all black. So at least we have always had some willing to challenge our assumptions and generalizations in society. We find often this cultural script goes so much deeper. Many people are afraid of the dark, as Barbara Brown Taylor addresses in her book we studied two years ago during the pandemic called Learning to Walk in the Dark. It eloquently addresses her own fear at night and her deliberate journey to grow in comfort with the darkness that comes in life. She teaches that which botanists and zoologists already know. There are plants and animals that thrive in darkness, and it isn't something that needs to be feared. I chose our second scripture passage this morning because I believe it points to this truth with divine significance. There are two Hebrew words regularly used for darkness in our Old Testament. The first one is used in our first text in Genesis. And while I don't speak Hebrew, I think you pronounce it Choshek. Choshek is defined as the conventional darkness of the sun's absence and the night's coming. Then there's Arathel which is a darkness in which God resides and can be found. Arafel is proof that we cannot assume that when things turn dark, that we are alone or that things are all bad or without hope. Instead, as Barbara Brown Taylor reminds us, we should remember that resurrection takes place in the darkness of a tomb. The caterpillar is transformed not in the noonday light, but in the blackness of a darkened cocoon. There are in fact some things in life it can only be revealed when darkness closes in, and we need not be afraid or deem it bad. Moses met God and conversed with God in the darkness of a heavy cloud, which was seen as a gift of protection from God's blinding light that could cause harm otherwise, not the other way around. I think part of the importance of looking at the nuances of light and dark 
is for us to recognize how in many ways we can easily see the complexities with fractured light particles, and yet how difficult it is often for us to apply that same wideness and grace for people, for situations, for experiences. We don't see people in situations as sunsets and sunrises with light and dark intermingling. Fear and insecurity dance together, but instead we label it as good and bad, those against us and those for us to our detriment. Rohr shares non-dualistic thinking is precisely contemplation. It's not a very inspiring term for what we thought was prayer, but it is clinically descriptive for exactly what is happening. The Holy Spirit frees you from taking sides and allows you to remain content in the partial darkness of every situation long enough to let it teach you, broaden you, and enrich you. You have to practice it for many years and make many mistakes in the meantime to learn how to do this. Going beyond the binary is to be able to be fully present and not rush to judgment. Not decide if this is good or bad, if this is for me or against me, if I like them or I don't like them. But instead to stay in the moment watching the sunrise and set, knowing there is always more than just one or the other. As we close, I'm going to share some images with you of sunrises and sunsets and horizons lines that are hard to distinguish the time of day. As you look at the beauty of creation and our Creator, not just separating light from dark, but giving it space to play and dance together. May you be drawn to consider those persons and situations in your own life that perhaps you have too quickly labeled in one camp or the other. Maybe you will find you have even labeled yourself. Hear the invitation to that, let those labels go and remain content in the partial RFL or God residing darkness that allows you to be more than just one thing and always deemed God's beloved child, no matter whether it's a moment of sunrise or sunset or high noon or midnight. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to join me in today's affirmation of faith, child of God. I am a child of God, God's beloved, in whom God is pleased. I dwell in the arms of God. You are a child of God, God's beloved, in whom God is pleased. 
you dwell in the arms of God. We all are children of God, God's beloved, in whom God is pleased. We all dwell in the arms of God. Amen. as you seek to practice this contemplative mind, allowing yourself to see beyond binary distinctions, but to rest in the mystery of the gray. Hear this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God make God's face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up God's countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of our Creator, our Savior, and Sustainer. Alleluia. Amen. <laughs>